So I think we can begin. Um, uh, Dr. Massimiliano uh, Riva um, is visiting us for this week and a couple more. Right? Yeah, uh, in the 23rd. Um, uh, he um, is um, his permanent address is uh, Desi uh, in Hamburg. He will talk about gravitational scattering in the world line effective field theory approaches. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and thank you for giving me the opportunity to talk about the work that I did during my PhD and the first part of my postdoc at DESI. And what I want to talk about today is this journey that we start in the uh, gravitational two-body problem. Um, I will try to motivate, uh, I will try to be as pedagogical uh, as possible. Sorry. Um, so we'll start with an outline of why we are interested in the gravitational two-body problem, what are um, the quantities that we're interested in, how do we study the gravitational two-body problem, in particular we focus on the so-called Postman-Koskian effective field theory, and uh, I will uh, explain how we actually compute quantity in this effective field theory framework using a high-energy uh, computation technique that I will try to explain in detail. And the, two -body, the scattering of two-body can be considered in first approximation as a scattering of two-point particle, and then I will uh, explain also how with the effective theory we can go beyond the point particle approximation, uh, including uh, uh, finite size and speed effect. But um, so without further ado, let's add why are we interested in the gravitational two body problem? One main, uh, one big uh, motivation is, of course, the uh, measurement of gravitational wave signals. And uh, we know that the main sources of gravitational waves are compact objects that in spiral one around the other in merger uh, into one single object and during all this um, uh, during all this scenario they emit gravitational waves during the spiral during the measuring during the ring down that we can actually see and the goal is to analyze this uh, signal to extract information about the compact object and about gravity itself uh, traditionally um, so you can split this um, the system in three phases, so the spiral one, the merger, and the ring down. And while for the merger, uh, gravity is strong, so we cannot uh, study uh, we cannot study analytically the solution unless we know the full solution to the Einstein equation. So for the merger, we have to rely on numerical relativity. But for the spiral phase, numerical relativity would take too much time because uh, the spiral phase is a long um, yeah. So the simulation for the spiral phase would take too much time. So uh, analytical solution, in particular perturbative analytical solution of the spiral uh, data are needed uh, in order to um, create a full template that takes into account both in spiral and the merger signal of the, um, of the gravitational wave emission. Traditionally, the spiral phase has been studied in the so-called uh, post-Newtonian expansion, which is a joint expansion in both small potential gm over r and small velocity d over c. That is because in a bound system, the, the potential and the kinematic energy, of course, are connected by the real, real theorem. So if one is small, also the other is small. And the post uh, expansion has been uh, very successful. And the current state of the art, I believe, is 4pn, so b to the 8th correction beyond the Newton uh, approximation. And there are essentially two main methods to study, either solve explicitly the gravitation, the general relativity equation of motion, and this has been done since the 80s, essentially, and a more uh, modern method that relies on effective field theory uh, developed by uh, Walter Bergen and Ira Rothstein, and then uh, many other people contribute. The two methods uh, are now, uh, I mean, they, they are actually agree on everything, and they both uh, managed to reach the same uh, state of the art. But what I want to talk about today is another uh, expansion Another perturbative expansion that has been a lot of attention recently, which is has been called post Minkowskian expansion. Um, it's just an expansion in small potential gm over v while keeping the velocity fully relativistic. Uh, for this reason, it's more uh, suitable to study a scattering phenomenon rather than a bound system. And I will comment on how we can connect actually scattering to bound uh, problems since eventually we're interested in the bound case. Um, and as you can see from this picture, the post Minkowskian uh, perturbative order that are um, depicted on the horizontal line, the post Minkowskian series is essentially complementary to the post Newtonian. So the two of them, in the sense that one order of the post Minkowskian expansion contains 
an infinite set of terms of the post-Newtonian, even if they are incomplete. But still, the two, um, the two expansions can learn from one another, and actually the uh, data from the post-Minkowskian uh, expansion, the current data from the post-Minkowskian expansion has been shown to be improving in some sense the so-called effective on body formalism that is the one that, that is used as a um, to, to tune the analytical data and numerical relativity. And this is not a new expansion in the sense that uh, the computation and perturbation in uh, G has been around for uh, since the 70s essentially, but uh, up to 2019, this was the state of the art, so not very high precision computation. The 2 p.m. conservative scattering, so the G square uh, conservative dynamic was known, but there was no computation for the three, no full computation for the 3 p.m., so the G to the Q uh, dynamics. Only some computation was made, some binary computation was made by Amati Ciapononi Veneziano, but only in the region limit where the velocity were, uh, so the energy of the two objects were much bigger than the mass. Um, then, yes, sorry, yes, yes, sorry. I understand. So, because as you said in the beginning, because of real theorem, V is related to. Yes. So, the, so in principle, post Newtonian is good enough for. Yeah, yeah, it is. But the, well, the hope is what? That post Minkowskian will have better convergence or. Uh, it, so, one. Um, so, post Minkowskian can, also, can actually allows you to compute the less term of the post Newtonian in the sense that some of them you know. And from an, from an effective field theory point of view, where you, as you will see, you compute uh, terms in terms of Feynman diagrams, you can isolate which one comes from which uh, uh, piece. But what, one advantage of the post Minkowskian is that since you keep the velocity fully relativistic, you are more sensible to higher order velocity effect. And this might, um, this should be more relevant for, for instance, eccentric orbit, because in an eccentric orbit, when the two objects are more close to one another, the velocity is a bit bigger, and the post-Newtonian approximation made a slight mistake, then the post-Minkowskian can help in, uh, in this sense. And the ultimate goal is, of course, try to resum entirely, I mean, try to resum also the post-Minkowskian in a similar manner as the uh, effective one body did for the post-Newtonian, and the effective one body has been also um, used to resum the post-Minkowskian, and it shows, at least with the data that we have now at 4 p.m., it shows a very nice conversion, almost, almost as, uh, as good as the post, uh, as the post Newtonian. But uh, for the moment, they are, there are two mo main motivations. One, it's complementary, and the second, there are, uh, it's a very nice theoretical framework to explore, uh, as you can we see, technique in, the, in between the classical and quantum mechanics. Uh, and indeed, the breakthrough came in 2019, thanks to uh, the study, thanks to the scattering amplitude community at first, uh, which suggested to study the scattering problem as a quantum uh, as a quantum problem, and then taking the classical limit. It might be uh, a bit counterintuitive why, why we use quantum limit. After all, we are scattering two massive, uh, two uh, compact, uh, massive macro macroscopic objects interacted by a classical GR. Uh, however, you can do a reasonable scale, and you essentially um, see that in the, in the system there are three scales that are the impact parameters, so the distance between two objects, if you want, the size of the object, so GM, the Dvalchi radius in effect estimation, and the quantum wavelength of the object that uh, basically tells you what are the quantum effects of the system. And what you want to do is to want a, you want a perturbative expansion in GM over B, that's your perturbative parameter, <coughs> and you want to neglect quantum effect, so you want quantum effect to be completely uh, negligible, and so you will take the quantum wavelength, well, wavelengths to be much smaller than the Dvachi radius, essentially, and the two objects quite far separated uh, in order not to have a strong gravity effect, essentially. That's your uh, perturbation parameter. When you translate this hierarchy of scale in momentum space, the uh, conjugate variable of the impact parameter is the momentum transfer Q. And you realize it's essentially this classical expansion uh, and the post minkowskian expansion, it, uh, it's essentially correspond to a small Q expansion at the level of, if you want, scattering amplitude. This was the uh, breakthrough of Bern et al., a collaborator that managed to compute the full 3 p.m. 
conservative dynamics, then other uh, people enters in, into the game, and another um, another alternative approach to the scattering amplitude uh, uh, approach is the classical effective field theory approaches that we described in a minute that uh, differ from the starting point. It differs from where you take the classical limit. In the scattering amplitude, you compute the full quantum amplitude and then take the, scattering, the classical limit. In the classical effective field theory, you take the classical limit at the beginning and then you compute the classical effective action as a part integral, as I will, will be clear in, uh, in a moment. Sorry, so you said that this expansion, so this naturally matches to post expansion. Yeah. But then you said that they compute, say, TM. Yeah. So that means you then further expand the result. No, no, 3 p.m. PM. Sorry, yes. Ah, okay. There is a confusion, but uh, PM <laughs> is uh, for <post> <laughs> cost. And, and this is the state of the art of the, of the PM expansion. Um, so after the 3 p.m. Uh, computation of PM, <laughs> <laughs> That's the, that's how it is. There is a lot of confusion in this uh, in this business, but it's uh, from now on it's going to be only PM. So that's no confusion. But after the G cube computation of Bernet et al, um, that uh, okay. One, one thing that uh, you, you probably already know: at G cube radiation enter into the game. The computation of Bernet et al was only conservative, uh, and then in uh, two years ago. Uh, the first the radiation computation of the three of the G cube uh, com contribution has been uh, done in different uh, way, and it is where I actually enter into the um, the computation. Then later uh, at the end of two thousand twenty-two, just, just the question that I don't remember the, the, the radiation energy goes like lambda in the sense of uh, acceleration Q phase square or not. Uh, so we are considering scattering. So yes, yes. It goes like acceleration square. Yes. Like I mean, it, radiation, like you're saying. it's essential. It's the equivalent of the yes. It's the equivalent of the of the brain this, is a, and, uh, this is a PM, so it will be some uh, general relativity correction. Yes. And um, <coughs> so yeah, and at the end of 2022, um, there are there were alternative way of computing uh, all in one. So considering both conservative and potential, uh, sorry, conservative and radiation effect by either uh, the group of Paul Vivek and collaborator using scattering amplitude and coronal approximation or by uh, Raphael Porto and or the group in Berlin of Gustav Jakobsen and collaborator that use classical effective field theory. And very recently, uh, like one month ago essentially, uh, Raphael Porto, Christoph Klapp, uh, Gregor Kalin, and then when you manage to compute the full, the full 4 p.m., so the G to the 4 dynamics cons uh, considering both conservative and radiation effect using e informalism in the classical effective field theory that I will describe now. I will not uh, describe the e uh, part, I will describe the, the, three, the, the first step, but generalize it to e in it's, uh, it's slightly more complicated, but not uh, computationally, but not theoretically. Um, and so, yes, let's enter into the more detail into how this effective field theory works. So, what we do is to consider the two compact objects as uh, external sources, non dynamical external sources of the gravitational wave. And this be, that is because you can actually show that the recoil of the, of the two objects is proportional, it's a quantum effect essentially. Uh, and the other thing, um, so you can, in perfect oscillation, consider the two objects as some point particle localized at, at, a, at a certain space time point, interacting, uh, they're sourcing, sorry, the gravitational field that is described by classical GR. So from the point particle action, and from here, I mean, we use the so-called Polyakov uh, parameterization of the point particle action, just because in this way, the way that uh, the, the sources can source the gravitational field is just one, it's just a linear way, of, um, so the, the two point particle uh, just the source of the gravitational way, uh, the gravitational field linearly. So we have only one final rule. Uh, while from the uh, Einstein interaction, of course, we find the usual propagator and then higher order um, self interaction vertices. For the computation that uh, I'm going to show, uh, we only need a cubic, but of course, we can compute the quartic and so on. Uh, and the dots there uh, will, uh, for the moment, 
we, we, are, we can ignore in first approximation, but of course, the point particle is not the end of the story. We can add higher order operator to include finite size effect or spin, as we do here in the end of this talk. And what do we do? Essentially, we perform a path integral with a subtle point approximation. So we consider only the connected uh, Feynman diagram that essentially allows us to compute the effective action described in these two objects to integrate out the, if you want, the gravitational degree of freedom. And we ignore every quantum effect by removing all um, diagrams that contain a closed loop. Because from a scaling reasoning, you can actually see that closed loop of graviton are always quantum effect in this context. So we can actually get the classical effective action describing the two uh, objects by just considering the, um, the all the connected Feynman diagram uh, without closed graviton loops. So uh, how do you see? Does this include gravitational radiation? It seems like it's only the closed loop. loop. No, I mean, what you are keeping. Yes, mm -hmm. it, it includes also gravitational radiation because as you can see, there are some, for instance, self-energy diagram. Mm -hmm. um, and the, this, uh, like the second diagram in this, uh, in this picture would never contribute if there was not uh, radiation, or at least it would contribute to a normalization of the mass. And uh, so we would throw it away, or at least we would hide it inside the mass of the object. But if you perform an in in formalism, you will essentially have an effective action that is kinetic term plus potential. And this potential will include, for instance, the Burke Thorne uh, um, piece that is responsible for the radiation reaction on the uh, equation of motion. You cannot, in this way, compute explicitly the emitted radiation, but you can compute the effect of radiation, for instance, on the impulse, so on the deviation, and from the balance law of the of the impulse, you can also compute the emitted radiation, for instance. But indeed, one way of doing it, I mean, one thing that you can do is to integrate out the uh, gravitons and then compute, particularly we focus on observables for one reason, that observables are gauge independent, and so the, their expression is much more compact rather than the action, the effective action contains a lot of gauge, um, uh, yes, gauge terms that are actually not physical. What you can do is compute the, for instance, in this way, the input as the derivative of the action. So, sorry, but so this effective action, it will be non-local and it has some major effect. Yes, there are also some non-local effect, non-local in time effect as well, but they enter at g to the four. Uh, no, related to radiation, and yes. there will be some imaginary part, yes. right? So yes. Okay. The statement about you know you can throw away the graviton loop is true to all other than g. Yes. Or? Yes, it's just from scaling reasoning. Uh, if you do what I was saying okay. here, just analyzing how they scale, just from the scaling reason you realize that they are quantum effect and, and that you can throw it away. And this was also the same reason that, uh, because this, the, the effect if you theory for post-Newtonian is very similar, uh, and you do a very similar uh, reasoning in that way. Suppose that uh, whether you want to compute directly, I mean, you want to focus on the radiated field and the radiated quantity, you can do it also in this way by uh, matching your, uh, so you start with gravity plus two point particle, you match that with this effective action, which is essentially, you know, linearized gravity plus a pseudo stress energy tensor that sources your field. This pseudo stress energy tensor will contain both the point particle contribution and the self energy, uh, so the, yes, the self interaction of the gravity, of the gravitational field. Once you have the pseudo energy tensor via this uh, matching procedure, you can then compute radiated observables, such as I don't know, the uh, radiated um, waveform or the radiated momentum, so the total change in momentum, if you want, in the system, and angular momentum, even though there are some theories now on angular momentum, and I will not enter into detail in that, but if you're interested in the end, we can talk about it. I just have to understand that the, the ellipsis there means that higher order diagram. But in the sense of non loop, but for example, Gravity yes, gravity. you can also add, okay, yeah, also gravity. another thing that we, I'm not considering here, it's multi-graviton emission, mm -hmm. but you can add that. Of course, you have to add to the effective action, a G in or right. sigma source. One last thing that I want to mention is just how to connect this with uh, what one might, interest, might be interested in when you uh, look at the gravitational wave signal in Ligon and Virgo, because of course we do not expect to see scattering events, at least not now. What we see are bound systems, so we need to find uh, a way to connect the scattering problem with the bound one. And there are 
different way to do so. Uh, one is using uh, exactly one body, this uh, formalism developed by Alessandro Bonanno and Tibor Moore. Well, essentially, you use the scattering data in, in, in uh, what, they, what they do, essentially use the scattering angle chi. And with the scattering angle, they reconstruct an effective metric that can describe both the scattering, uh, so the effective metric can describe both the scattering problem and the bound problem because it's just, uh, uh, it's just a matter of you know, analyzing the continuum from positive to negative energy. Another thing that you can do is to, if you come from the amplitude, for instance, computation, you can match your amplitude with an effective potential. And again, the effective potential will be uh, depending on if you have positive or negative energy, we describe the scattering or the bound problem. One mm, more recent advancement has been done by Raphael Porta and Gregor Kalin, uh, which is uh, what they call boundary to bound map, that essentially allows you to find direct um, connection between observables in the scattering case and observables in the bound one via an analytic continuation. In particular, they started from the field of formula. But it's the, the final uh, result, for instance, is that you can compute the periastral advance, which is a observable in the bound case, by just analytically continuing the scattering angle. Um, this is a, a subject of a free paper, and I will not enter into details, but we can discuss afterwards. But the, the key um, lection, le, like the key information here is that there might be a possibility to analytically continue all the scattering data to the bound one. Uh, and that's also why scattering data can be useful uh, and used in live and be one in the future. Okay. This is proven or is just observed? It is proven for some cases, like for delta phi, so the, the periastral advance, it is proven. When you include radiation, it is. Uh, there are some things that cannot be analytically continuous, so in particularly the non-local in time memory effect uh, are not yet analytically continuous, it's very hard to do so, but uh, the local radiative effect can be also analytically continuous. There are some, still, some uh, pieces that are missing, but uh, this is definitely proof in, uh, in the first paper. For conservative, it's uh, definitely proof, and tradition, there are some subtleties here. Yeah. Yeah. So, Let's enter into one particular computation that I found instructive and that allowed me to show you how we do, uh, how we actually compute things. And this is the computation that I did during my PhD, essentially was to try and compute the leading order Bram's run, so the leading order addition emission. So the first thing that we did was to, uh, of course, compute, as I said before, the Sessan tensor via the matching procedure. Uh, and for the computation, we just need so for the computation that I'm going to show you, we just need the SSG tensor up to order G. And one thing that you can realize is that, okay, I said, you have only one way of sourcing the field, as I said before, the linear way. Uh, however, this source, of course, will depend on the position of the, of the point particle and the forward velocity of the point particle. As the two bodies interact, of course, this quantity, so the, for instance, the forward velocity will change and will depend on G. Uh, the, the, the deviation, if you want, from the straight velocity will depend on the g. And so what you do is uh, it's do a perturbative expansion of the forward velocity and the forward position, and you can compute the correction delta 1, which is over the g, and delta 2, which is over the g squared, uh, recursively. And once you have this correction, you can insert it back in that, uh, uh, in that diagram there. And so you compute the effective action to the g, you find the deviation at order g, and this allows you to compute the next uh, contribution to the SSG test, so if you want. So effectively, what you do is to split this um, single source, uh, uh, single source uh, final rule into a tower of uh, effective final rules. So the first one is you know, a particle moving along in a straight trajectory sourcing a gravitational field. Then the second is, for instance, representing the two particles interacting the one of the two deviates and then source the gravitational field again. And you can do this recursively. And for instance, for the order G, stress energy tensor, you only need these three diagrams. The first two describe what I just said, so the deviation and then uh, source of gravitational field. The last diagram instead is the first contribution of uh, self interaction of gravity. And as it's clear because it contains the cubic vertex. Uh, you can compute the stress energy tensor, and in principle, okay, once you have the stress energy tensor, you square it and you find the emitted uh, radiation. 
It seems um, easy enough. However, if you try to compute explicitly the SSLU tensor, uh, at least the best that we could do was to rewrite it in terms of some integral of Bessel function. And if you try to square that and integrate over the phase space to, to find the total emission, then the, the final integral is uh, very uh, hard and actually you couldn't find a way to solve it in this way. This is where uh, high energy techniques enter into the games. And so to solve this, and actually this is, a, this is an example of for the emitted uh, momentum, but this is how all computation are done in this business. The first thing that we did was to recast the computation as a loop computation, because once, in particular as a two loop computation, once we have uh, a loop computation, then we can use all the uh, techniques that have been developed in uh, high energy physics in particular, integration by part uh, reduction, and I will uh, explain what that means, uh, that essentially allows you to, to reduce the problem to just a solution of a bunch of simpler master integral. And this master integral can be solved using a differential equation method that I will show you uh, in, a, in a minute. So I will go to these three steps um, in details for this example, for this particular example, but this is in a more general way of how to compute the uh, quantity in the cosmic cost and effectiveness theory. So, first thing, let's try to rewrite this as a loop uh, integrals, and you can uh, intuitively understand this because, uh, as I said before, essentially the radiative momentum, if you want, is the square of t mu nu, with the integrity over the phase space, so the delta plus there. But you can reinterpret the delta plus as a propagator that has been cut because, as you might know, in, uh, in particle physics, when you have a propagator that is cut, it means that it's put on the shell, so it's evaluated uh, if you want, it becomes a delta function. So rather than seeing that integral as a square of a Stessinger tensor, we see it as a, a two sources exchanging one graviton that is then put on the shell, so that delta <coughs> function becomes a cut propagator. And in this way, you can recast the uh, emitted momentum as sum of some loop integral. In fact, we, by a, a smart change of, uh, of variable, what you can do is essentially, uh, first of all, focus on the scalar. So you, you can decompose on a complete basis. Uh, for symmetry reason, for the point particle the case, you can see that the total emission, the total emission has to be proportional to one plus two. Then you focus on the scalar quantity, so you remove the Lorentz in this, and the scalar quantity that we call EPP, as you can see, it's basically an integral over Q, which is a Fourier transform from Q to B space of an object, that I, that is a genuine two-loop integral. It's just an integral over L1 and L2 of some propagators. Some of the propagators are linear, are linearized, as you can see, like row one, row two are linearized, and uh, this comes from the fact that we've taken a classical limit, and um, I have, I can talk about more. I can talk about this more at the end. But the other thing is that some propagators are cut, are delta function, um, so one must be careful uh, about that as well. However, there is this uh, other um, technique that has been uh, implemented to solve a loop integral that goes under the name of reverse unitarity, that tells you essentially that as long as uh, integration by parts are uh, considered, you can do, you can differentiate delta function as a standard propagator. You just need to be careful that some symmetry might be broken because now delta function, of course, uh, if row one, for instance, is, uh, depends on L1, if you send L1 into minus L1, of course, the delta function is symmetric, so you need to be careful on the symmetry and you need to be careful on some integral that might go to zero, but there are automatic programs and there are actually uh, like demonstration that this uh, reverse unitarity works, so you can differentiate delta function as standard propagator and use the second step that I'm going to describe now, which is integration by part. Uh, reduction, for those of you that are not familiar with integration by part, I have this very simple slide, which essentially, you know, for instance, that it, 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 let's say the one loop massive integral with a generic exponential a for the propagator. Then integration by part identity is the second identity that holds as long as you are in B dimension, of course. Uh, and if you solve, you can solve this, um, this identity uh, iteratively in A, and you essentially find in the end that all the family of integrals, of loop integrals with generic A, can be found 
just by solving one simple master integral, which is the one with a equal to one. So the idea of integration by part is to solve this set of identities and find the relation between some complicated loop integral and some uh, less complicated loop integral. And rather than solve all of them, you can just solve one. The simplification is even more uh, astonishing at two loop, because remember what we have is this uh, i that I wrote there at the second line. We uh, realized that that i can be uh, written as, an, as a combination of this family of uh, two loop master integral g, and uh, using Lightred, which is a program in mathematics that allows to automatically solve uh, the integration by parts, we show that you, you can see that that i is actually a linear combination of just this four master integral. So rather, and remember that that numerator n in i it was coming from the contraction of the cubic vertex and all the other uh, contraction of the stress energy tensor. So it was a long expression. It can be reduced to just some coefficient times this master integral. So the goal now is to solve this master integral, remembering that we have some underlying propagators that are delta functions. So we have reduced the problem to solving a complicated two-loop integral to just solving four loop, two-loop integrals. These four two-loop integrals can be solved with the, the last thing that I want to describe, which is the differential equation method. That is because, let's analyze this, uh, this loop integral. Of course, uh, once you integrate L1 and L2, the integral will be function of only the external kinematic variables. So it will be function of uh, the four velocities, so the incoming moment that you want, <coughs> and the exchange momentum q. One thing that I haven't mentioned is that due to this Fourier transform here, you can see that the uh, exchange momentum q is uh, orthogonal to cos u1 and u2, which means that since the, the integral that we have is a scalar integral and can only be function of scalar quantity, it cannot be the function of the square so the modulo, if you want, of u1 and u2, because they are normalized to 1. And it cannot be function of q dot u1 or q dot u2, because this is 0. So they are function only of the scalar remaining, which are the modulo of q, and the contraction of u1 and u2, which is the Lorentz factor, if you want, the initial Lorentz factor of the two objects. And of course, the dimensional regularization parameter. Of these three objects, only q is dimensionful, which means that we can fix the dependence on q just by looking at dimensional analysis. And the only non-trivial dependence is on gamma, or equivalent on the variable x, which is introduced because uh, it removes some square roots in the differential equation. But the, the key thing is that you can write the differential <coughs> equation in just x, and so solve the differential equation rather than uh, solving uh, the four master integral. Why it's, it's more um, convenient that is because this four master integral form a complete basis, which means that when you differentiate it, you find a different integral, you can IDP reduce that integral and you still find a combination of the previous four master integrals. So you can write a closed system of four differential equations. And this differential equation, as we showed by the work of Hand and collaborator, can always be put in this form that is called a canonical form. That is, you split essentially the dependence between the uh, from the dimensional regularization parameter epsilon and the kinematic variable x. And this form has always a closed solution in terms of polylogarithms, or at least a two loops that always a polylogarithm, and you can actually solve it perturbatively in epsilon, because uh, essentially you are interested in the end in the epsilon goes to zero. So the advantage of the differential equation is that it gives you the solution for all four master integral in just one go. The only thing that is missing is, of course, some boundary conditions fixed to this differential equation. And so rather than solve for the four master integral, in all, uh, in all the region, we solve it at just one point, and we choose it to be the static instance. So we solve the master integral in a point that might be here. Um, the only thing that you need to, be, to remember is that this, this master integral has two loop integral and contain delta function, and solving two loop integral with, with delta function is actually not trivial. However, there is a way to connect uh, cut master integral to master integral uh, that are not cut, not cut. Um, so the first thing that we can do uh, is to just as a to, to have a better idea to, to, to have a clearer explanation is to rewrite this master integral as uh, diagrams. This is just a way of uh, of representing them. 
and then we need to find a way to connect the cut master integral to the g that we want to the uncut one, because the uncut one master integral are easier to solve. And you can do so by using Katkowski rules. And Katkowski rules are essentially a generalization of the uh, optical theorem, but uh, valid for a single diagram, so for a single looping integral. They are listed there. Um, and essentially what they, what they are telling you is that there is always a relation between the cut master integral and the uncut one. And for instance, for the simpler uh, master integral G1, you can see that one, the rule of the Kapkowski rule tells you that the sum of all cut in a given channel, so in this case the S channel, has to be zero. Uh, and then the, the Kapkowski rule also tells you what are the uh, other cut that we have not considered. So the, cent the one in the center is our master integral that we found from our IDP deduction process. The one on the left and the one on the right are just the uncut that once uh, evaluated as um, complex conjugate and once evaluated as it is. Since the sum of these three has to be zero by Katkowski rule, it tells, is basically telling you, uh, this is very similar to the optical theorem, that the cut master integral is twice the imaginary part of the uncut one. So uh, summarizing uh, all this, rather than solving the cut master integral in one point, we solve the non-cut master integral in one point, then relay this result to the cut one uh, via Katkowski rules and then fit this to the equation of uh, to this differential equation to find the solution for the master integral. Putting everything together, we have reduced the two loop integral to just four master integral g1, g2, g3, and g4. We solve them by a differential equation and uh, fit the boundary condition as the static limit of this uh, four master integral. Putting everything together, you find that the final uh, total radiation at g cube is given by this function essentially epsilon. Uh, which is just some polynomial in gamma and uh, some log dependence on gamma. This log came out because the differential equation, as I said, at two loops can always be solved in terms of poly logarithm. And these logs can be understood as resumming the post newtonian series in a sense. In fact, if you expand this in small velocity, you find agreement with post newtonian results. And this agrees with uh, some previous computation that was done by the scattering amplitude community. Uh, using very similar uh, techniques. The difference with respect to the uh, scattering amplitude, as I said at the beginning, is that we take the classical limit from the beginning, and this has some advantages. Uh, for instance, it reduces the number of master integral that we have to solve. Um, this. Uh, because this would be a law of one plus something, and this something is typically. Uh, if you if you expand like small, small velocity. Small velocity yes. uh, so this is really this log is just a resummation of all the. Uh, small velocity expansion. Uh, this is not the end of the story in the sense that you, we can now generalize this in the spirit of effective field theory to describe more physical object, so object with a finite size, for instance. That's what we did uh, uh, afterwards. And this, uh, I mean, it's interesting because uh, signal, um, so effect of finite size can give uh, that, that you can see in the in the emitted signal can give gives us some hint on how uh, an object uh, I mean how the equation of state inside the object um, constraints some equation of state inside the object in particular for Newton star or can gives us also some hint on the existence of other compact objects that might not be uh, neutral star or black holes. So they see see the coefficient. Yes, I'm going to introduce in a bit. So what you uh, do essentially. You take the point particle action, and then you add some higher order operator. This higher order operator are essentially Riemann square, and these C are some Wilson coefficients that are unknown. They, they describe, they depend essentially on the equation of state, so on the internal structure of the object, if you want to. And why you preserve parity here? Um, I mean, could you write something that is parity on, since it's an extended object? Mm, so yes. Some even quadratic in the Riemann, right? Like a Riemann dual Riemann of a power something. Or These are quadratic in Riemann law. No, no, I mean, yeah. yeah. They're quadratic, but they are. Um, Parity in tau, yeah. 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 Because um, essentially, okay, you can add odd, but they, they would correspond to some absorb. Uh, um, yes, because if the, if the system do not absorb radiation, then the system might be times. Uh, like a single object, you can say one single object that is time symmetric. 
uh, but if they have some radiation that enter into the game and the object absorb this radiation, you can we might add some odd uh, operator, but they would describe this absorb absorb phenomenon that you can neglect in the first uh, approximation. Well, I'm so I'm assuming I'm naive, but probably why would would be natural to think that it would be all quite right. So there is a favorite uh, direction of let's say dynamics. So why what do you think the extra things here? So if you uh, indeed I mean you can the subject could be spinning. Right? Yes. yes, yes. So that's it this breaks. Uh, in this case, we're just considering non spinning. Oh, okay. So ah, this is for non spinning. Yeah, in this case, sorry, yes. We're just considering non spinning dynamical tides. So tide induced by the interaction of the other oh, okay. For spinning objects, we, I will arrive in. Because in that case, yeah. it will be. Yeah, no, of course, not. Sorry. Sorry for the confusion. Of course, these are just uh, ty dynamic tides. So the C are the. Um, Yes, if you want the Wilson coefficient that are responsible, that describe the response to an external uh, interaction with the other object. And um, so, yes, so they can be uh, rearranged in this way as a function of electric and magnetic component of the uh, Riemann tensor. And for instance, the first that you can think of is a quadrupolar deformation of the two objects. And the only thing that you need to change is that you add some uh, Feynman rules due to the fact that now the two objects can be deformed and emit through this quadrupole. It might seem redundant uh, or it might seem hopeless to see this effect because uh, if you analyze the scaling of this uh, Wilson coefficient, these Wilson coefficients are connected to, uh, to the log number. And if you analyze the scaling in G, you can see that, for instance, the quadrupolar uh, C uh, for the electric uh, deformation will go like G to the 4, which means uh, essentially in the radiation G to the 7 effect, so very high effect. However, it, uh, in front, you have the ratio between the um, size of the object and the Schwarzschild radius. So if your objects are not black holes, and in fact, for black holes, you see it's actually zero, but if your uh, objects are not black holes, say neutron star, then the ratio R over the Schwarzschild radius might be big, and this effect might be enhanced and then ends, ends enter before in the uh, perturbative expansion. So even though they seem to be very higher order effects, so G to the seven, they might enter before because of this ratio in front, so because of the size of the, of the object. What I described, all the steps that I described before can be done exactly in the same way. Uh, you just need to, to add these three extra uh, contribution. And what you find in the end is that the emission for the tidal, it differs from, differ from the point particle, but because now when the two objects are distinguishable, uh, we like for the point particle case, the two objects, of course, were are distinguishable. So the, the result in the end was symmetric in M1 and M2. For the uh, tidal effect, they are not, it's no longer symmetric in M1 and M2. M2 but the four master integrals that I described before are enough to also find this. And it makes sense because they, the master integrals that, that we found before are a complete basis for a two loop computation in general. So we, we didn't introduce any new family of master integrals. So in the end, the result will always be again some polynomial function of gamma and some log uh, coming from the differential equation. Uh, at the time, we checked this uh, new result with uh, post Newtonian data, finding uh, complete, uh, complete agreement on what is known. Of course, the only caveat is that post Newtonian data are available for the bound uh, trajectory, so you need to analytically continue this result to the bound case. Uh, but we found agreement up to next to next within the order. Then, uh, like at the subsequently in the, the next year, an independent computation by the group in Berlin of Gustav Jakobsen collaborator, and then a computation by Carlo Heisenberg confirmed this result uh, to an order in, uh, in B because they found actually the same result. Finally, let's come to spin. Uh, so now the object not only uh, actually we don't include in this way uh, in this sense uh, dynamical type, but we include. Uh, permanent multiple of the object, so we consider the object to be spinning, and we uh, modify the effective action. In this case, we don't talk about the action, but we talk about the Ruthian, because uh, this is a well-established effective field theory uh, developed by Raphael Porto and uh, Jan Stein of collaborators. And the Ruthian, for those of you that uh, know it, essentially behave. It's an in-between object. To the, uh, Lagrangian and Hamiltonian, it behaves as a Lagrangian for the position of the particle, but as an Hamiltonian 
of the spin. So as you can feel here, it's the equation of motion. These are the equation of motion of the spin uh, of the object. So now uh, we include both um, the, if you want, the, yes, the, the spin of the object, but also some finite uh, size effect. So this CE is, again, it's a Wilson coefficient that depends on the object. It is minus one for the for Ken, but I call but it can be different in, in general for, a, um, for, a, for an initial start. The only, uh, the other thing that you need to be careful is that when you uh, work with spin, you normally introduce this uh, wheel bind to go to a locally flat frame. So you have uh, some Lorentz indices and some local flat frame indices A. Luckily though, uh, if you expand this wheel bind in the, in the perturbation in G, at least uh, if you consider H, where G, yes, if you consider a cosmic Toskin expansion, essentially you find that these uh, local frame indices and the Lorentz frame indices are Distinguishable, and, and the other thing that you need to be uh, need to implement is this spin supplementary condition uh, to fix uh, the gauge essentially. But once again, the only thing that gets modified are the Feynman rules. So now not only we have a linear way which is different to source the, the gravitational field that is that depends on the spin, you also have a directly quadrupolar way of sourcing the spin. Uh, sorry, the gravitational field. Uh, the final rule is very long, so I haven't written down. But the computation proceeds in exactly the same way. Uh, we can turn up to quadratic or next spin. Of course, one can go higher or then if, if it wants. So you just need to add other uh, effective uh, operators in the root scene. And finally, you redo exactly the same procedure that I described in the point particle case. Uh, you just have more, uh, more complex uh, more complex uh, construction because now you have also spin. And so while for the uh, non-spinning case, the scattering as you may know, happen in the plane, when you consider spin, the scattering no longer happen only in, in a plane. So for instance, the radiation now no longer is, uh, is no longer only confined in the plane of the motion, but you can have radiation also in the direction of the, for instance, orbital angular momentum of the two body. Um, so we computed exactly in the same way as before. We find uh, at the time the, this new result, we checked again with post-Newtonian results that were available up to 40 uh, and this was confirmed later by, again, a computation of uh, group uh, in Berlin by Jakobsen and Mogul that used a different, uh, actually different uh, supersymmetric world line uh, action, but they found exactly the, the same result. And I'd like to conclude and to thinking that I'm, I hope I convince you that uh, effective theory, world and effective theory method, proved to be uh, an efficient way of tracking, tracking the cosmic Gaussian expansion for scattering uh, phenomenon. There is another interplay between classical computation and high energy uh, techniques that might be uh, explored even further by trying to include other techniques such as double copy and progress in this sense has been done uh, by the group of Frank Huber and uh, Kurt Bagliatia. Um, the other thing is that uh, now the open questions are, one open question is for instance the inclusion, like the analytical continuation of a non-local time effect. So the non-local time effects, memory and tails are still something that uh, need to be understood uh, more thoroughly in this uh, formalism. But for the scattering computation, it can be done because uh, um, Rafael Porte, Gregor Kalin, and Robert Ritten say develop this in formalism that allows you to compute the local time effect as well. The problem is that we, cannot, we don't know how to continue to the bound case. The, as, you might as you might have understood, the bottleneck of all this is essentially be able to solve loop integrals. And we are now able to solve up to three loop. Four loop is uh, definitely a huge challenge, and five loops even more. But there are some uh, studies currently on the uh, try to push the, the solution of the loop integrals even further. Um, with that, I conclude, and I, if you have any question, I will be happy to, to answer it. Thank you again for your attention. So, one question. In the general approach, you have all these high-order operators with arbitrary coefficients. 
we, you know what they are for, say, a car black hole, or mm -hmm. so those are yeah. known. Yeah, but only for car black hole, yeah. Uh, uh, anything special that you can see in this line form? Or you can stare at it? It's, uh, are these coefficients special in some sense? Or? Uh, they should, uh, for, for the, you mean for the specialized case of car black hole? Let's say a car black hole. Um, I mean, not particularly, they, because essentially, uh, they are. They come from uh, studying one single compact object. Yeah. So when 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 you have a curved black hole, of course you know the, the two solutions. So you can you actually know uh, what they are. They are more interesting for uh, like neutron star because we don't know what they are. They 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 are function of the uh, equation of state. And so if we find some um, constraint of this coefficient from the signal. If you find the, the signal of the gravitational wave depending on this coefficient, then find some constraint based on this. This might help in you know constraining some theory of the equation of state of the Newton star. But yeah, no, for, for black hole, I wouldn't say they are particularly illuminating. But it's a good check that you actually find the kind of black hole, for instance. Yeah. Just a second. Here, apart from the two expansions, the, the G expansion and the host. And the little gamma expansion mm -hmm. of the newtonian there are two more expansions. One is, as you said, like the spin expansion. Yes. But then there are at least two more that I, I probably I didn't call it. One is the alienation expansion, the spin expansion. So yes. there should be some parameter. But apart from that, you mentioned that it's true that when, when there is a coal coalescence of two in the curve, the orbits are not are not planar, so you will have some emission mm -hmm. with some angle. Mm -hmm. But at the late time spiral, they become little bit uh, yes so then there is also this parameter to the spiral, yes right? i don't know if there is a um, like a systematic framework expansion for this parameter uh, the problem is that all of these it's not valid for late time or at least if you don't know higher order correction you cannot trust the late time in spiral you can do uh well, basically because emission energy yeah. becomes very big and yeah. in the moment you can try to resum this uh, this series using Kinesian theory, and in the last uh, one of the last paper by Godamor and Retegno, uh, they show that uh, with the four pm uh, due to the four data that uh, I've reported completely recently, um, there is a very good agreement in numerical relativity once you have resum through the UV. So this might be a, another motivation to push the computation. Even further, because then you might have a better way of you know connecting the um, analytic data with the numerical one. And try to find that region which is the, the, of the last uh, the last stable orbit and the full numerical computation. For instance, late time, in principle, one expects that neither mass nor speed in this state they, they can change, right? Yeah. So is it, is it this effect appears in your order. I mean, you, you, you can <coughs> no, you cannot actually see in this perturbation. You cannot go, you cannot push the, the value. Really the, yes, one. because the problem is that this uh, perturbation is valid as long as you have clear separation of these objects. Whenever right. these two objects are too close from uh, too close uh, to one another, then it's, uh, you cannot trust this anymore. The value is GM over B, B so GM over the distance. That's why uh, you have to find a way of resampling if you want to go uh, all the way. Good. You mentioned some uh, supersymmetric uh, wall line. Uh, yeah. So that's you just introduce some wall line formulas to take yes, account uh, of things. So I, I'm not uh, an expert on this. This is the work of uh, Gustav Mogul, Gustav Jakobsen, and so it's an alternative to the root theorem? Essentially, yes, it's alternative to the root theorem. You describe the spin through with a supersymmetric variable. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, th they show that you can describe the, the spin with a um, Grassmann variable, uh, not Grassmann variable, uh, that enjoy a supersymmetry. Mm -hmm. That I know of, it should be valid only up to quadratic ordinate spin. It's not valid to all ordinate spin like the root theorem. Mm -hmm. uh, but for the moment, quadratic spin is actually the best that we can do in computation, so it's uh, it's good. But uh, there's there's a long review by Jan uh, Stein of uh, Jakobsen and collaborators on how this world line, supersymmetric world line, actually works. Yeah. Uh, 
there are no other questions, let's let me see them again. And Masmeja will be here in 9.12 also for... Uh, yeah, yeah, I will be here and um, I will be more than happy to discuss with any of you.